Today's interview is with Dr. Edward B. Roberts, the seminal thought leader and scholar on entrepreneurship and innovation and the impact it has had on our society. Dr. Roberts is the David Sarnoff Professor of Management of Technology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the founder and chair of the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. Dr. Roberts' most recent book, published in 2020, is Celebrating Entrepreneurs, How MIT Nurtured Pioneering Entrepreneurs Who Built Great Companies, a firsthand account of the past, present, and future of entrepreneurship and at MIT from the man who has led those endeavors since the beginning and the stories of the entrepreneurs nurtured by MIT. Professor Roberts has also engaged in co-founding a dozen enterprises in board service to about 40 startup or young firms and in angel investing in about in over 150 companies over the past 55 years. Good afternoon, doc, Dr. Roberts. Good afternoon, Ed. Thank you um, very much, Phil. <laughs> As uh, I really appreciate your introduction. Thank you for that <laughs> plug. And uh, thank you for the plug on, on my book, which uh, I think uh, will in fact be relevant, especially as we go on, the first half of the book is focused entirely on the development of entrepreneurship across all of MIT with every one of the major stages and organizations that we'll end up talking about documented in this. And frankly, I participated in every one of those organizational formations across MIT, not just the Entrepreneurship Center, that, uh, that I found it is that I really appreciate what you're doing because I would have loved to have had a source of consultation in all of the time period that I was both behaving as an individual researcher and advocate of entrepreneurship at MIT alone. And as I got involved in all of the organizational building that took place over well, about 50 years of organization building. Uh, and not only was I alone for so many years with nobody else as a colleague relating to entrepreneurship, I had plenty of colleagues, but none relating to entrepreneurship, but I really had to overcome significant discouragement. Uh, I, it took years before anyone at a senior faculty level uh, said to me that they thought that what I was doing was a useful thing to be doing. Until that time, I probably had tenure by that time. And, uh, and until then, I was basically being discouraged because I was working in an area that nobody thought was worth bothering to work on. Uh, that also came from people in industry. MIT has had the oldest industrial liaison program in the world, started decades and decades ago. The clientele of the VPs of R&D and engineering of major corporations who pay an annual fee to MIT to be able to get access to what's going on in the research labs and the like. And because the group that I created was focused, the first business school group focused on managing R&D and technological innovation, because of what the whole group was doing, we became the hotspot for the senior members of the client companies, because the VPs of R&D and engineering who ordinarily would be coming only to see what's going on the latest in electrical engineering or in mechanical or, or in physics or what have you, when they heard that there was a group that was focusing upon their problems, we became the most popular visit group at MIT. And when I would be talking to these guys who were the senior clients, the VPs of R&D and engineering, they would say to me, Ed, why do you want to waste your time on these little companies? You're doing such interesting stuff of relevance to us. Why don't you just spend more time on our problems rather than all these things? And then they would, they would lecture me, you realize, Ed, it's only Route 128 and Silicon Valley that have a number of these small companies that aren't very important. And if you just spent more time, and I would say, well, I said, I appreciate your point of view, but you do understand I'm doing a lot of work that is directly interesting to you. Oh yes, yes, it's great, so do more. I said, well, 
out of my own interests. I'm interested in looking at what's happening of these young entrepreneurs and in the building of these young companies and the like. And as a result, which is very relevant to your audience, I began starting to do research on corporate entrepreneurship. And I did it solely because I wanted to have a translation. I wanted to be able to demonstrate to the large firm executives that what my studies of small startups would, was showing also related to them. And I would use those studies, among others, to try to demonstrate to other large corporation executives that the same kinds of things I was learning about independent entrepreneurs could be translated and transferred into thought processes that would help the large firm develop itself. As one of the godfathers of the field, what are your thoughts on the evolution of entrepreneurship programs in universities in terms of the role, position, and teaching methodologies? That's a broad-based question that uh, involves many pieces. The first is I'm thrilled with the overall development of entrepreneurship as a field of interest and of active teaching around the world. And it's much more so more than just the United States because the proliferation of entrepreneurship programs worldwide has been spectacular, uh, particularly during the last decade and so. So I, I really think it's, it's wonderful. With respect to the notion of the variety of teaching methods, they are indeed that, a variety of teaching methods. Some of the methods are, in a sense, response to constraints, and some of the methods are response to personal taste. Now, with respect to the traditions, the traditional entrepreneurship center, which goes back a long, long, long time, long before I started one at MIT, the traditional entrepreneurship center was started by usually successful entrepreneurs who wanted to cultivate uh, imitators and followers and who loved the entrepreneurship and loved their own personal success, often gave back to their own alma mater. And part of the give back was more than money, it was time. And many of these entrepreneurs who were successful then came and volunteered to create educational courses and then programs and then centers. But that, that was wonderful, but it had a constraint. The constraint was that these people basically were telling the story as they understood the story. They were talking about teaching others to imitate them. They were talking about how they as individuals and their friends, because they all had other entrepreneurially successful friends, they would bring in their friends, how they and their friends succeeded. And the, the kinds of spread that would take place in a typical entrepreneurship course was dependent upon how many different friends they had in terms of industries or focus on what they had done or, or what have you. Maybe they included some service companies as well as product companies, that would be diversity. Uh, maybe they included a friend who had, had started a company in another country or which became an international company, that would be a diversity. Uh, but all were experiential. And from my point of view, I suspect that today, the bulk of entrepreneurship is still primarily experiential teaching uh, by leaders who built entrepreneurship and the like. Now, experiential teaching goes beyond the person who succeeded teaching it that way, because the case method has enabled experiential teaching to become the primary mode of education in most business schools. And the case method is experiential. So it, it's tell, it tells it as it was to someone in some case, in some situation. That's wonderful, but it's limited. And the difference in what we did at MIT was because I started my, my activity as a young assistant professor in a system where I wasn't going to get re reappointed or promoted or tenure unless I did high quality research that was acceptable as high quality published research in referee journals. And that's the only way I could advance at MIT, regardless of the department. 
So I was in the management school. My PhD was from economics, which was very academic, but I was in the management school, but the characteristics of the management school were the same as every other part of MIT. Namely, uh, we were being judged upon the quality of our research. So I approached it as a building of my portfolio of research. It happens, I started my first company the same year that I started my first research project. It was a consulting company. I was Jay Forrester's assistant in system dynamics modeling. And uh, I wasn't thrilled with the way in which he was proliferating the field outside of MIT. And I decided and talked another grad student into working with me to start a consulting firm to try to bring system dynamics to the outside world. And by the way, in 1963, when I presented that to my senior professor, very powerful man, and said that Jack, my partner, and I are going to start a consulting firm to spread the word and system dynamics to the outside world. He looked at me, stared at me, and said, Ed, some people will feel you are not serious about an academic career. That was 1963. This is 2060, Ed, 21. So that's 58 years ago. So I guess maybe I was serious about an academic career. The whole notion of entrepreneurship was itself a questionable notion. And to try to advocate it as an academic field was really fighting against the tidal flow. And so I got no encouragement. And consequently, I just worked extra hard. So I did, I carried entrepreneurship as a research field, but I also, I mentioned I was working on system dynamics modeling. I did, I did more books in system dynamics than Jay Forrester did. I did a lot of work on system dynamics modeling in all, all fields. I also worked on technology innovation and the like, which were legitimate, that was okay to do. So in a way, entrepreneurship as a research field was an overload that could be ignored by a senior faculty member by saying, oh, well, but Ed's also doing some really interesting work in something that they regarded as okay. Now to go from the notion of starting to do work in an area where there was essentially no support system internal to the institution uh, was a little tough. And frankly, I worked that way for 25 years. There was no other faculty person at MIT doing any work on entrepreneurship from 1963 until 1991, when I got approval of my dean at the time to start an entrepreneurship center. And with the approval came approval for bringing in hiring new people and the like. So, I mean, I, I suspect that some of those who follow your lead in terms of the information that they get have had comparable experiences of finding that they themselves had to be pioneers of change. They had to be academic entrepreneurs within their own institutions to be able to pull off the creation of an entrepreneurship program. Hey, at MIT, if you are a pioneer, you are respected. So uh, this is why, by the way, the book says how MIT nurtured pioneering entrepreneurs. I am differentiating in the book those who actually pioneered new fields. So I'm only the book has four chapters in which I focus on different areas of, of technology and market. And I'm talking about the people who created the fields, not the ones who came along later on and were me too. Uh, who may have been very important and, and great creators, I'm talking about the ones who founded the fields and who built them with major entrepreneurial launches. And the fields that I cover, I start with biotechnology uh, and life sciences. And the second one is the internet. And the third is from CAD CAM to robotics. And the fourth, because I decided I wanted to be very different and controversial is modern finance. And in each of those fields, I am limited to talking about people from MIT who left MIT to create the pioneering firms that pioneered the industries. And that's very different. And 
and I did it in part because I spent so much time in my life at MIT and I know what MIT respects and they respect pioneers. So the difference between, and, and everybody who teaches entrepreneurship knows this, the difference between me too entrepreneurship, where you come in and you are either an imitator or an incremental add on uh, entrepreneur, that's okay. And that can produce wonderfully successful things, but to be a pioneer of creating a field that didn't exist before, where you are the first of a species, wow, that's real different kind of entrepreneuring with far more pain and suffering and far less likelihood that you're going to be successful. But among other things, at, at MIT, that's respected. So, but, and of course, that isn't all we teach because you can't, you can't limit yourself to assuming that every student that you have is going to end up being a pioneer. We try to inspire them to being entrepreneurs. If they have it in their guts, their minds, and their associates to do something that's truly pioneering, more power to them. And, uh, and it's different. So that, that's inclusive within the program. It's not exclusive. We don't, we don't limit ourselves to that. As a, as a pioneer in entrepreneurship center um, management, what do you consider to be the foundational pillars of a successful entrepreneurship center's operations? That's a tough question. Uh, that, that's really tough. I, I think that uh, in a way, a center uh, can't function as an extension of an individual. And uh, I couldn't create a center and, and be the center. I, to create a center, the key thing was to get my dean to agree that I could hire faculty. Uh, because by hiring faculty, you suddenly are enabled to multiply yourself with respect to not just research. I mean, at MIT, research is important, but someplace maybe it's not so important. But teaching is important any place. And an individual can't teach everything. I mean, if you could, then you really would drive yourself crazy uh, in, in terms of workload. So if you took a normal academic workload, uh, which at MIT is pretty light. At MIT now, it's just, it, when I started, it was four courses down to three, and then now it's two uh, in, the, in the management school. And some other places, my wife was a professor of education at Lesley University. My wife had a six course load. Uh, so, I mean, you can teach, you could be teaching that at a business school as well in entrepreneurship, but that's still not really enough to be able to reach a large number of, of students in a small institution, maybe an individual can be the center, but in a larger institution, you need, you need partners. And that says that the key thing first is having colleagues that allow you to have a broader set of teaching, because you asked about education, and have a broader set of educational inputs and specialties and the like. My recruiting strategy approved by the dean and approved by those people who signed off on my proposal, and one of the things that I sold in talking to each of them is that what I wanted to do is I wanted to run joint research programs, joint search programs with each of the department heads. I wanted together to get a slot from the Dean for a teaching slot at a, a, in entrepreneurial finance and a teaching slot in entrepreneurial marketing and a teaching slot in entrepreneurial strategy. And I wanted to do it collaboratively in our search process with me and the heads of each of those functional areas of the school. And the deal that I made with the Dean and with all those heads was during the first two years that a new faculty member would be at MIT hired in this entrepreneurship mode, that faculty member would only teach entrepreneurship classes entrepreneurship classes that could certainly extend into their functional area, but entrepreneurship classes. And only after year two, 
where they be accessible by the department head to now teach standard courses that are outside of the area of entrepreneurship, which meant every new faculty member was going to get charged with the responsibility for developing what was likely to be a first course in that department's listing that included entrepreneurship. So we brought in all of these people. They became a broad-based group of, and of entrepreneurial faculty, but with very different specialties when they came in. We, of course, put a lot of effort into bringing them together, running, running seminars where they would all be attending because they were interested in entrepreneurship. So the entrepreneurial finance professor would be coming to a, a session where we're bringing in someone to talk about uh, market, entrepreneurial marketing. Interesting to learn about that stuff, even though it's not their own stuff. So this was something that we did as a building strategy to try to get encompassing other areas than, than my own area. I wasn't an expert in strategy or marketing or finance. So I needed all of those people to build outwardly. Now, we also had a point of view that was in my original proposal, which everybody bought into. And that was that we were going to have what I called a, I don't know, sort of a two-faced strategy of education. It would be that we would want to commingle practitioners with academics. Is this so the addition, dual, dual track? Is this what dual the track. dual track? That's what I call the dual education? track. Yeah. Right. And I said, ideally, it would be wonderful if we could have two faculty in the front of every classroom in entrepreneurship, one of whom is an academic specialist, the other is an experienced practitioner and the like. That would be ideal. We have seldom achieved it because it's tough to pull off. And it's tough to pull off because of the somewhat incompatibility of those two people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easier to have a fully academic course on entrepreneurial finance as a typical example, which is typically very academic. Uh, I think it's very academic wherever entrepreneurial finance is taught, by the way, uh, as a specialty. And it's, it's easy to find experienced practitioners who are quite willing to teach a course that reflects them and cases and projects and the like, and they're great. And if we have recruited good people with recruiting good teachers and good mentors to do that, it's hard to create a, a course where the two of those people can come together and jointly teach a course. And we've done it on occasion and not always. So my aspiration was aspiration, but not fully achieved. It was achieved in part. It still is achieved only in part. Uh, I'm teaching a course right now, a brand new course that I decided to design and develop this year. And I'm teaching it with a practitioner. And so I can do it. Why? Because I'm comfortable in, uh, in reaching out and not feeling that this is going to be a problem in, in any way. And in addition, I have enough practitioner experience myself that he doesn't threaten me in any particular way. Although I don't have his, on his industry experience. He's been leader of some major corporations. He also has been a two-time uh, entrepreneur himself. Uh, he's been on the board of very major corporations and the like. So we're very different. And very different, certainly. And he's never he's never written any academic paper, and he's never done any academic research. But he also respects it, and he thinks it's very interesting, and that he learns from it. So we have that, and periodically we get the same kind of peering taking place in some other course we're running. But frequently we can't pull it off. So we have a bunch of very good, experientially oriented courses, which we do via the center via the Entrepreneurship Center. We have, we have a cluster of people that we call entrepreneurs in residence. They are people who have built successful companies. They are uh, the entrepreneurs in residence. We, uh, I would say we take advantage of our market position. We do not pay uh, the entrepreneurs in residence. They are all volunteers. When we suggest that it would be good to pay them, usually they say, no, nah, come on, I don't need that. 
I, I don't need that. You know, I, I don't I don't need your money. And uh, if I if you paid me, I'd give it back to you as a donation anyway, which is nice. And very typically, the entrepreneur in residence is somebody who will be full time for three years to five years. And then they're ready to go back and start another company or they may be ready to retire at, at that stage as well uh, or go on to doing some doing something else. We also have senior lecturers and senior lecturers are paid and the senior lecturers come from mixed backgrounds uh, and they're not still on the academic channel because our academic channel is assistant professor and, and up. The senior lecturer is still sort of off to the side and is seen as somebody who comes in with experience, but more readily linked into the academic institution itself. So we have the diversity of regular academic channel, assistant associate, associate with tenure, full professor, uh, and the like. So that's the regular channel. And then we have the sort of to the size senior lecturers who are there to be teachers primarily, but they have industrial experience and they're interested in working more closely with academics in an academic environment. And we have entrepreneurs in residence who are clearly entrepreneurs and they're, they're teaching, but they are teaching from the experiential mode. We have them in our very advanced practitioner oriented courses. So we have a course, Bill Aulet, my wonderful managing director of the center, uh, co-teaches every year with one of those entrepreneurs in residence. He teaches a course called Getting Something Done. Well, the, it, the actual course is called, from the student point of view, it's called GSD, and you can decide for yourself what you think the S really stands for. But in the catalog, it says Getting Something Done. And in order to be in that class, you have to be actively, currently involved in the development of a new company as a student. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the prereq for applying to get into that class so that everybody in the class is now trying to get something done around their own agenda of what they're working on. And that class is taught by two very highly experienced individuals working with the students in teams and mentoring activities and the like. So this diversity in the kinds of offerings we have, because there's diversity in where our students are across the board. The place where we are weakest is while we have created an undergraduate minor in entrepreneurship, that is our area of most weak. We have not developed a strong undergraduate curriculum in entrepreneurship. We have courses, it's not a strong curriculum. Uh, which in a way uh, it's surprising because MIT has been a heavy undergraduate institution for years, but uh, I think that it, it's, it runs more against the grain to be pushing undergraduates at MIT toward being instant practitioners than it does to be dealing with graduate students in the same way. And uh, so that's, that's our area, I would say, of weakness. Uh, in the graduate school, we're very strong. The, the Dean of, for Undergraduate Admissions uh, at MIT says that more than 50% of those applying to MIT say they would like to start a company before they graduate. Right. Um, do you so think- this is crazy, but, that's a, but he's, he's, he's talking from, his, from the reading of the applications. I've had those discussions with him and, he says, Ed, this is so different from what it has been in earlier years. And he can, he can document the trend mm -hmm. in the content of the applications. Now, uh, what do they do? How many of them, in fact, start companies before they've graduated? We don't yet know that mm -hmm. uh, because we haven't done a recent updating of the study, I did two studies of all of MIT alumni, one in 2005 and then one in 2015. Uh, and we haven't done a more recent update. Uh, there, we were looking at all alumni of MIT, all, and looking at focusing on their entrepreneurial activities and the like. Uh, 
we did not have very many people in those two samples as going up to 2015 graduates who said that they started companies while they were undergraduates or, or immediately upon leaving MIT. For most of them, they started companies uh, later on and the like. And, but graduate students are different. Graduate students in the Sloan School, we have, the, we have started 10 years ago, this thing called the Entrepreneur and Innovation Track. And you apply to get into the track uh, once you have been got, gotten into the Sloan School. Last year during the pandemic, when we were not room size limited in how many people could be in the track, we had 55% of the entire uh, uh, first year program of the Sloan School enrolled in the Entrepreneurship Innovation Track. Ordinarily, we would have been limited to 130 people because that's the maximum size classroom that we have. And we would cut off at that point, put people on the wait list, but by, the, by two weeks after the beginning of the semester, uh, we would terminate the wait list because we, uh, we would take care of whatever dropouts occurred in the first couple of weeks and replace them from the wait list. After that, we couldn't take them because there was no room in the class to take them. We were, we were, we were up against fire, fire law codes that said that we couldn't put more people into this largest uh, classroom. And I've taught in that classroom. I started and I, and I chaired the entrepreneurship and innovation track until this past year. Now I co-chair it with another faculty member. Uh, and I've taught in that largest room for years with a lot, with a full room of students. Sloan has 400 students, 410 being admitted each year to the MBA program. We are now again limited to 130 students who could be in the track. So we're limited to under what our internal demand is, even just in the Sloan School, for being in our track that is really focused upon entrepreneurship. Now they can still take lots of courses, but they still can, they can't be in the track itself. At the undergraduate level, there is no track. They're, they can take undergraduate courses in entrepreneurship, but there isn't a special track that is going to move them ahead in a, in a really strong way. How, you know. how do you um, weave the different methodologies into your entrepreneurship curriculum? I mean, what I'm talking about is design thinking, lean startup, voice of the customer, you know, jobs to be done. You know, it, it's, th these are, um, you know, they're all very popular, they're all being taught, but how do you weave them into your curriculum? I would say we don't. Uh, we really don't try to be advocates of a particular philosophy of okay. the right way to teach entrepreneurs. So uh, in the class I taught yesterday, I was talking about lean startups uh, because it happened to fit in with the subject matter of yesterday's class. So I brought it up and I was discussing that in the class, but the students aren't going through a lean startup program. It was a point of view that, that had an important place in the discussion that we were focusing upon yesterday. So I brought it in. The same thing would be true of other faculty members who have comfort with different approaches. The only part of MIT where there is uh, a singular methodology is we have a National Science Foundation grant in the engineering school to be taking PhDs uh, into a transformation program. And it's the NIH program to it. And the NIH has provided essentially the base curriculum for that program. Is this i -Corps? Yeah. Is this i -Corps? Uh, is I it core. I core? Yeah. Yeah. So we have an I core program. One of my former PhD students heads the I core program at MIT, which is fine. Uh, we were given the opportunity to propose I core from our entrepreneurship center. We were invited mm -hmm. to do that uh, five or seven years ago. Uh, we rejected it. And we rejected it because we said uh, we're not going to adopt a singular methodology for teaching, which we do not believe uh, really accomplishes all that we would like to accomplish. So, so we, don't, we don't become the advocate, uh, we don't 
pick up somebody's flag and raise it. Okay. Uh, and we don't have our own flag in the sense that we don't we we couldn't describe to you just as I did before. I can't describe to you a singular way by which we do things. We do them all and we do them in multiple groupings for the student to choose. So if a student can fill her or his elective requirements in the E and I track once they've done the required course, the only required course that they must take is my entry course that I've taught. That's it. They're past the requirement at that point. Beyond that, they've got a little bit of distributional kinds of things, and then they've got a total number of electives that they have to take, a total that they of points that they have to accumulate. Well, they can spread their points across a very large number of courses. We now have about 60 subjects offered across MIT that are clearly uh, entrepreneurship subjects. Many offered in different departments. In the architecture department, they're teaching entrepreneurship now. Uh, would a Sloan School student who has an architecture background or who's interested in real estate, would, would a student say that uh, he or she wants to take that architecture class? Yeah, it would be on our long list of electives that are there. So it would be okay. They wouldn't have to get special permission. And at MIT, there's no, no uh, boundaries across departments. Uh, anyone who has a prerequisite can register for any uh, individual subject across all of MIT. And similarly, if there's enough critical mass, you suddenly find a faculty member in a given department like mechanical deciding that, hey, we ought to have not just a course in entrepreneurship, we ought to have a little bit of a subtrack. So that if they're interested in this, you know, they can take a couple of courses down at Sloan and do some here, and that'll be okay for a mechanical engineering grad student. And so this is where we have proliferated across all of MIT. Most of the courses out of the 60 in entrepreneurship, probably 35 or 40 of them are Sloan School faculty based one way or the other, including courses taught by senior lecturers and the like, but, but with Sloan numbers. Sloan is course 15. So we know what a course is, but it has 15 point some set of numbers after it. Uh, so 40 of the 60 probably are course 15 subjects, management subjects. The rest are distributed across the rest of MIT. That's interesting the most significant public effort today to stimulate entrepreneurship at MIT is in the life sciences and biology. And the effort comes from the former president of MIT, uh, Susan Hockfield, and one of the senior entrepreneurial women faculty in, in biology. And they are attempting to encourage not just PhD students, but junior female faculty in the life sciences to get into entrepreneurship. And they're running seminar courses, no, no academic credit, but they're running seminar courses aimed at junior female faculty to encourage them and to teach them more and to give them examples of, of uh, other women across the country who are, given that this is a grid motivation, we have women faculty from all over who are entrepreneurs flying in to participate in the Susan Hockfield seminar program for junior women. It's a, so I mean, you, these days entrepreneurship is a great thing. And uh, the entirety of MIT would be skeptical that there ever had been a time period where there was no encouragement whatsoever. And there was one course at MIT which was a practitioner course taught by a successful practitioner, one course, that's it, with a typical enrollment at the beginning of 10 to 12 students, period. Uh, today, we've kept the same name, New Enterprises. We've kept the same number that it was in 1961 when that first course was offered at MIT. Today, we have two sections a semester, taught both semesters, and each of those sections has about 60 students in it. So from 10 or 12 students taking it when it was alone, 
We now have 250 students taking it when it's merely one of 40, 40 subjects that they could be picking from. So it's, it's a very different demand set today and we love it. Um, what would you advise universities and directors that are just starting their entrepreneurship centers and programs? And what are the curricular and co-curricular programs that they should start with as a foundation of their center? You know, because you said co-curricular, I really want to start with that. Okay. In, in my book, what is very clear is that I document the phenomenal effort made by alumni and activity generators to really create what became the base for an entrepreneurship program. The first, the first activity that I was a co-founder of was an alumni activity to create a seminar aimed at alumni. We tried to convince the alumni association that they should have a special track for MIT alumni interested in entrepreneurship. It took two years to convince the alumni association that that was worthwhile. They didn't think it would possibly recruit enough people. They finally let us do one trial seminar our metric that would have given us success, which was agreed on, if we could get 30 alumni to sign up for a weekend seminar, they will agree that there's enough interest that maybe they should create a little programmatic thing of having repeat programs. We cut off enrollment at 250 people and we offered the same seminar for Another, six months later to the same group. And we only were recruiting from New England alumni within a 10 year age group. <clears throat> That's all, those are the only ones we invited. We invited people who were from the ages of, I think 25 to 35 and only from New England states. We invited nobody else. That caused the kickoff of the alumni entrepreneurship program. Well, the Alumni Entrepreneurship Program now worked with alumni clubs all across the United States. Over a three-year period of time, I keynoted eight sessions, weekend sessions, across the country to a total of 3,500 MIT alumni, weekend sessions, using each local MIT club as the base and using people from the club to do the entire program. We laid out the program. They now had to work with us to find somebody who could teach the marketing section, the finance session, the, the session on, on product design. So what our curriculum was for the weekend, the head of the alumni association in each city would say, okay, we can find people to teach that class, that class. And I was the keynote speaker opening every one of those 3,500 alumni. Now, suddenly, we had a body of alumni saying, hey, this stuff is really important. MIT ought to be doing more. We only had one course, that one course that had 12 people in it. That was the only education we had, but we now had alumni. Well, one of the spinoffs from our nationwide program was the creation of the MIT Enterprise Forum. The MIT Enterprise Forum was created first by the New York Alumni Club. They called it the New York Alumni Venture Clinic. They changed their name two years later, why? Because we started the MIT Enterprise Forum by that name of Cambridge. And the New Yorkers decided that was a nicer name. So they became the MIT Enterprise Forum of New York. And now that we had two of us, we rolled out a program that ended up with 26 chapters of the MIT Enterprise Forum worldwide. Again, nothing happening inside of MIT to support that. We were doing this as a standalone organizational entity with alumni. So alumni activity, and then we start to look at the formation of student activities. Well, the creation of student clubs was very important. There was the creation of a thing called the MIT Entrepreneurship Club. It was an undergraduate club. And it wasn't very well organized, but it functioned and it got people to come together. There was a second club started in the Sloan School and it was an entrepreneurial management club. And every now and then the two clubs would have a joint meeting together. Again, students, no curriculum yet. 
This was before we had an approved center, before we had more than one course, we had alumni activities, we had student activities taking place. We started the MIT 10K business plan competition, which became the 50K business plan competition, which became the 100K business plan competition. When we had the 50K competition, the leaders of the 50K decided, we ought to replicate this program worldwide with other people in other schools. And they started the MIT Global 50K competition uh, program held annually in a different city of the world to mentor people from all over the world in how they could do the same thing that was going on at MIT with respect to student clubs, the enterprise form and like. All this, in a sense, offload. No, I was the only academic involved with any of these activities. There was no program. There was no center. It was all pre-center alumni, students. And that was very helpful in my selling the dean that there was demand for us doing more within the management school in the area of entrepreneurship. So what I would say is, hey, co-curricula is not just very important, it's easier to pull off by pulling together a critical mass of students or alumni. And you know which alumni to pull it together, the alumni who have already started companies. All you have to do is have some visibility on who they are and go to them and say, hey, wouldn't you like to replicate your own experience by encouraging other alums to do what you've done? The one thing that I found ages ago is, is entrepreneurs love entrepreneurs. And if you go to an entrepreneur and ask them to help an entrepreneur, that's the easiest sell that you have. You go to a group of entrepreneurs and say, don't you think it would be terrific if you guys and gals, nowadays and gals, in the old days, no gals, uh, if you got together to encourage others to, to learn from you and you know, be terrific, you would give them a seminar on how you did this and, and such and such would be great and talking about the whole financial area and what, you know, and you know, they look around at each other, they say, yeah, sure. So I, so I think that the co-curricula is very important. And uh, there's not, we don't make an attempt to mix, we attempt to stimulate both sides. So uh, if, if a student comes in with another kind of idea of a co-curricular activity, uh, we are as supportive as we can be if it makes any sense whatsoever. Uh, and uh, we fight like hell for more slots for entrepreneurship. And it's just now, today, it's mm -hmm. very hard because the fact that we, because we're at MIT, we must be looking for people who are going to be very academically rigorous, research oriented and the like. And now we expect that they're gonna be able to show us doctoral dissertations that illustrate the kind of work related to entrepreneurship that we're interested in. And now there's schools all over the place that are producing such PhDs. Mm -hmm. So we can find such people, but the competition for those people globally is phenomenal. So we are fighting against uh, schools all over the place for the best and the brightest. And the way you run an academic institution, as you understand, you got to balance all kinds of things. So we see ourselves today as uh, heavy on senior faculty in entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And so our slots, we have we've decided we're going after junior people. Uh, we would like people fresh out of their PhDs or one or two years uh, past their PhDs so that they could show that they've been doing something on their own hook. Uh, clearly, someone coming in at the assistant professor level, maybe a year away from getting promoted to associate or two years away from getting promoted to associate, but, but junior. So we're trying to balance. And the other thing today, the pressures on, on DEI, on diversity and, and uh, 
equity and inclusiveness are uh, seen in a place like MIT as very important pressures. So we are trying our best in very tight markets. Uh, so if you looked at if you looked at the number of minorities getting PhDs from good universities with focus upon entrepreneurship. I mean, if you're talking about more than a hand of those people who are going to be sought by very large numbers of very good competitive institutions, it makes life uh, particularly difficult these days to build. Uh, we cover an awful lot in our present programs and our students are totally free to amplify what we're offering them within the management school by offerings all over the place that are similarly curricular offerings. Uh, at, you know, my illustration of somebody who's intrigued by real estate, thinking that she or he would, be, would do well to take the course in entrepreneurship offered in the architecture department. You know, that's a smart student. I don't know who teaches it. I know there's such a course. Um, and the student who's interested will have sought that out and do it. Uh, and there's similar kinds of things. The students, the students are smart enough to follow their own leads. Most of the teaching done in the other departments is to their own students, uh, and which is not unreasonable. Uh, part of that is, uh, is our limitations. Namely, we are class size limited. So, uh, you know, we have, we have our building, which is terrific, nice building, mm -hmm. but there's a limit to how many people you can enroll in, in every class. And the school, not necessarily me, but the school uh, gives priority to Sloan School students in terms of enrollment. So if there's a class that is size limited, it may very well be a non-Sloan student would be prevented from getting in. One of the things I did, oh God, longer than 10 years ago, uh, maybe 15 years ago, is I got into a major fight with our enrollment office about just that issue. I said, I want our students to be in mixed teams with engineering students. Mm -hmm. And we can't do it when the engineers can't get into our classes. So what I, I mapped out a series of classes that I wanted to have to be team taught and mixed teams. <clears throat> and I finally persuaded them that they should set aside 25 to 30% of the seats to be non-Sloan School students. Now, the Sloan School is very well organized in its, in its registration processes. All Sloan School students are registered by the end of the prior semester. The engineering school is not so well organized. The engineering school manages its registration on registration day at the beginning of a new semester. So I get fights with our enrollment people saying, Ed, you're telling us we should be leaving these seats empty. I say, no, no, no. I'm telling you, you should delay filling these seats till the engineers have had an opportunity to bid on them by this. So, well, what do you want us to do? I said, create a wait list within this loan school, wait one week or two weeks. And then if we haven't filled them, fill the empty seats. And that has given us a lot of, we have a whole series of courses where that's the structure of the course. Uh, we call them venture classes because the courses use real projects coming in from MIT research labs as the base for the study of the entire evolutionary process of a firm and, and the like. We started it with our innovation teams course. It was our collaboration with the formation of the MIT Desponde Center. So the Desponde Center was feed us faculty research projects that they thought were ready for careful study and analysis and help with student teams. And the student teams were all mixed teams, management students and technical school students, science and engineering. And from that as an example, we then proliferated the model. So we went from innovation teams, which was generic and could handle any kind of a technology being fed by this big lab set, set up. We went to energy ventures, which was the same course, 
but limited to energy research and development projects at MIT. We went to healthcare ventures, same course, limited to healthcare research projects coming from MIT. We did that in five different areas. So we have different courses that are technology or market focused courses to real classes with mixed teams of students. And by the way, any, any school that has an engineering department could do the same thing. And that applies not just to domestic things that could go overseas. And the notion of faculty members in a, in a technical school being engaged in outside activities of starting companies is still not accepted in a lot of places. So, you know, so, but, but that relates to this whole business of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It is now worldwide, mm -hmm. but of necessity by cultural differences, by rules and regulation differences, by economic opportunity differences, you find that there have to be different acceptable and effective patterns of building entrepreneurship programs, both in the United States and especially in other countries. In other countries, we can find places that we would say uh, are just like us, sort of, mm -hmm. that they do very similar kinds of things. But we also find a lot of other places that not only aren't that way, couldn't be that way. And in many cases, wouldn't want to be that way. It would be a violation of their culture, what they think is appropriate and the like. I respect all of that because mm -hmm. I think that people need to function within their own surrounds and uh, they do. Uh, we are fortunate that our surrounds now, now, but not before, encourage entrepreneurship across MIT, encourage faculty involved in entrepreneurship, encourage students involved in entrepreneurship and the like. I'm talking about top level supportiveness, <clears throat> supportiveness, sometimes top level action taking, sometimes. But for the most part, I return to what I said earlier. The groundswell came from students and alumni. Mm -hmm. The faculty buildup was very singular for 30 years, unfortunately because nobody else was interested in doing entrepreneurship research and studies until finally there was enough student interest to help me with my colleagues in all the other parts of the Sloan School agreeing. So change, but change takes place slowly. Mm -hmm. No hesitation by the head of marketing, although they had no, no work being done in the field, but it, he absolutely immediately said, yeah, that would be great. If we could get a marketing person that was interested in the kind of marketing of new products and new companies, he says, that would really be very uh, good kinds of stuff. He says, but well, it's going to be very hard to find those people. I said, right. But together, don't you think we might have a chance? And he says, yeah, you're right. Sign. And, and, you know, so this was the kind of bit by bit struggling to get and, and, you know, by then I was, I was senior. By 1991, I was now a 30-year faculty member. I was an assistant professor from 1961 on. So having been around, having been on all the committees, having done all the things, having run all the programs, I was certainly one of them, the senior faculty of the school. And I was non-competing with them. I wasn't trying to take anything away from them. And I was proposing a collaborative institution in which we would work together at the group level to find people that met our joint needs. And I ran joint research projects with the head of marketing and joint search projects to search for junior faculty, the head of marketing, with the head of finance, with the head of international programs. And in some cases we failed and in some cases we succeeded. We succeeded first in finance. We succeeded in international management. We failed in marketing twice that we, we tried with the head of marketing and me as the search committee and we struck out. We could not find anybody that we both agreed was acceptable. And later, much later, somebody came in who began to teach uh, marketing, uh, marketing entrepreneurship and innovation courses uh, post the time when we were doing joint searches. So somebody who wants to build a center has to first bring her or his own 
point of view to bear on it. Secondly, it's a bad idea to be rigid. I think you need to be very flexible because you're working in an area where you need colleagues and you need collegial uh, integration and collaboration to get things done. Entrepreneurship is not a discipline area that can stand on its own. Finance is, entrepreneurship is not. Marketing is not. Marketing is collaborative by its nature. Strategy is collaborative by its nature. But so some things are, they could get away without talking to anybody else. Economics, they can get away with only talking to economists. Badly, but they do it. Uh, but if you're in entrepreneurship, if you only talk to entrepreneurship people, you ought to be having very dull conversations. Because what you really want to be doing is you want to be talking to people in other areas about entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and trying to see if you can't enlist their perspectives to aid you. So I think we've been successful because we've had the, the ability to pull that off over a very long period of time. I wrote the book in part because I wanted to give people a shot at how to do it faster. Mm -hmm. And we, we talk about all the different institutions that came to play. So each of the different organizational models are described and discussed how it took place. Every one of them took place with, if not battles, it took place with long time delays before they could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the venture mentoring service, was the first organization at MIT following the creation of the MIT Entrepreneurship Center, following by 10 years. Nothing happened for 10 years organizationally after I started the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. And the next thing up was the Venture Mentoring Service. There was a faculty member in engineering who said, more and more students are trying to become entrepreneurs we ought to be giving them the kind of help and guidance that we aren't giving them. And sure, there's a bunch of courses down there in the Sloan School, but we ought to be doing something across MIT. The competition between the engineering school and the management school or the, the looking down your nose from the engineering school to the management school is I think quite traditional in a lot of other universities as well. Much better now because of entrepreneurship. You know, we were working collaboratively to create that next, and that took, that was 10 years after the Entrepreneurship Center. Five years after that, we created the Desfande Center for Technological Innovation, which was in the engineering school to fund faculty research that was assessed as having high probability of commercialization. And uh, the question was, how are you gonna do that? And they said, we're gonna depart from our traditional internal judgment processes of only having senior faculty judge internal research uh, grant awards. We will bring in outside venture capitalists and entrepreneurs to supplement the faculty in evaluating the awards for this particular center only. Mm -hmm. So they will not only assess the quality of the research, they will assess the possibility of commercialization of the research results. That was the MIT Despondé Center, it still functions that way. And prior to its announcement, the chairman of the MIT Corporation came to me and said, Ed, the, the cooperation with the MIT Entrepreneurship Center is gonna be critical for that center to succeed. I want you to be meeting with the guy who's gonna be appointed the head of it and figure out how you two guys are going to work together to help the commercialization role. And he told me who the person was going to be, who was going to be appointed a month later. And uh, we got together right after. And at our meeting for two hours, we talked through what could be done. And we, that's what the meeting, we invented I-teams, innovation teams. We invented the notion that we will let that lab, that center feed research projects that are now a couple of years along so that we can better sense them into a student course of mixed student teams of engineering and Sloan students. And the projects would be to take each research idea as a team all the way through from the original technology, the intellectual property, the market issues, 
the competition, the applications that are intended all the way through. And at the end of the course, the, each student team will make a recommendation relating to the project. And the recommendation will be either, well, it's a very interesting thing, but we think it really needs to go back to the research lab for further research. In a sense saying, you know, we don't see this as a commercial thing, regardless of what it was supposed to be. Secondly, second recommendation is, we think this is a really interesting idea. It will be great as an add-on project or uh, uh, production or product line in some existing company. Recommendation number three, we think this is a phenomenal idea and it looks like it could be the base for starting a new company. If they had that recommendation, there was a very high likelihood that student team would in the very next 100K competition be introducing that project mm -hmm. as, as a team project frequently with the faculty member involved or with the faculty members RA or PhD or postdocs involved who had been working with the student team during the course. So one of the agreements was that each faculty member in the Nespande Center who was being funded agreed in advance that she or he would cooperate if selected for one of these iTeams programs. So again, you know, we invented a relationship of cooperation. In the announcement of the center by the MIT News Service, the announcement to the press announcing the new director, the new program, the new money, everything else said, the MIT Entrepreneurship Center will collaborate with the center in efforts to help commercialize pro research projects coming from this, from day one. And as the institutional involvement started, we got involved in every single one of those kinds of, of activities and changes. And that strengthened us. That caused big changes over time in the engineering faculty attitudes towards the Sloan School. Because among other things, their student, their best students would be reporting back to their faculty that, you know, those guys aren't so bad. You know, you, they're, they're really nice. They know some things we don't know, we don't teach. Hey, we really ought to have a course in mechanical engineering where we talk about uh, the issues of market and the like. One of the standard jokes I used to say uh, as a faculty member, because I had two degrees from electrical engineering at MIT, I would say the only time I ever heard the word competition in my classes in electrical engineering was when the professor was discussing Stanford and everybody would <laughs> laugh. Everybody would laugh. It was true. It was true. Nobody ever talked about competition as something that happened in a product or process market. They didn't know from that as something you told an engineering student about. So I, I think that, I still think, by the way, engineering education, at least at MIT, uh, and maybe every place else as well, or most other places, could use a lot more ingredients that would draw from the mentality and to some extent, the content of entrepreneurship programming that would be typically taught in a business school. And, if the, and to some extent, the engineers who are teaching entrepreneurship courses in the engineering school are doing that. Too much in terms of there being very old kind of courses, namely talking about the course of the companies they've started because now so many of them have started companies in addition to their academic work, they can run experience-based entrepreneurship courses in the engineering school. And I, from my point of view, too much of that. Uh, they would be better off if those courses were co-taught. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Those courses were co-taught if we were co-teaching with an engineering faculty member in the engineering school department with an academic faculty member from the Sloan School. So we have a lot of deficiencies and we have a lot of things that we've done well and, uh, and we continue. And the numbers, the numbers keep growing. The student numbers keep growing. And, uh, and the, course we're pre the new course we're presently teaching, the new course is called Overcoming Obstacles to Entrepreneurial Success. And the course is a life cycle course. Each week we go a next step in the, in the life of a company 
and we go from founding with people and funding money all the way through to exits. At the, in the last week, uh, we'll be discussing alternative exit strategies. And each week, a successful MIT alumni entrepreneur is the case, live case in class. And we have student teams working on what the problem was that was presented by the entrepreneur as the problem they had to overcome at this stage of their company building activity. And we spend the entire class stage by stage and each week we move to the next stage with another entrepreneur, another real problem from a real case and, and the like. So uh, that's the first time we've done a course that itself is what I'm calling a life cycle course. The rest of our courses have been much more focused and segmented either to, to capture a kind of knowledge base like finance or like mm -hmm. strategy and strategic thinking or like marketing. And they can do a lot of different things, but nevertheless, it's very functionally focused. Uh, or they're focused heavily on startups, the planning of a new enterprise, which is typical. So we have our array of new enterprise courses to get you started and go through everything and end up with a pitch deck or a business plan or what have you, or idea evaluation and what have you. So those are stage-like things. Very nice to have uh, work with you on this. I hope that it gives you what you wanted to get uh, out. And uh, I, I, th I can't thank you enough. I've enjoyed this so very much. Yeah, well, it's fun. Uh, I, you know, this is why I have had fun essentially my whole life at MIT. And, and I stick to what I said to you at the very beginning. I think that what you're doing is a very important service to a lot of people who can use help. 